Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Today I want to talk about some of the catastrophic dead ends we face if we plow blindly ahead with the promised green energy future. Today's elites are obsessed with CO2 and climate change and are determined to replace hydrocarbon fuels with solar and wind energy and other yet-to-be-invented technologies. But have they really thought this through? Do they understand the physics and the economics of the so-called green utopia? My guest today, Mark Mills, has thought it through and has a stark message, an inconvenient truth. (laughs) Mark tells us, and I agree, there won't be a world powered entirely by wind and solar or batteries. The reason I say that is because it is not possible. We don't have the materials and we can't afford it in either environmental or economic terms. Mark and I have talked about this before. He's, I think this is the third or fourth time Mark's been on because he's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> but I think we agree we need to push back even harder against where the climate change agenda is leading us. And Mark probably knows more about this than anyone. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute focusing on science, technology, and energy issues. He's also a faculty fellow at the McCormick uh, School of Engineering at Northwestern, where his focus is on future manufacturing technologies. He's also a strategic partner in an energy software venture fund. And he also wrote one of my most interesting favorite books, uh, The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s. Congress get to the point of today's show, Congress has appropriated trillions of dollars to what should now be properly called the climate change industrial complex. People are getting rich from the green agenda. And if you consider the vast worldwide habitat and species destruction that will be caused by substituting wind and solar for hydrocarbon energy, I believe these people should be called villainous, not virtuous. So, Mark, this is great to have you back. As you can see, I have a pretty strong point of view. <laughs> well, don't hold back, Bill. Don't hold back. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of which I came to from reading some of the great yeah. stuff you've written, including your recent testimony um, to Congress. I think you were in front of the uh, U.S. House Committee on Energy and Commerce just, uh, what, uh, last month? Yeah. Yeah, back, back preaching the gospel of reality or try, trying to. And, of course, Apropos the subtitle of my book, The Roaring 2020s, uh, Congress uh, and the Federal Reserve are working very hard to make sure that doesn't happen, it feels like these days, as not only uh, by printing money, as we all know, but by uh, implementing programs of spending on the, quote, Green New Deal, which is what the infl- what, exactly what the Inflation Reduction Act is. It's a funding of the Green New Deal. In fact, they've come out of the closet and admitted as much, and they call it that now. It's no longer a secret. It's an open secret yeah. that the hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies, mandates, and funding are being directed at changing how we get our energy. You know, Goldman Sachs did an analysis that confirmed my back of the envelope, and I'll con- I'll confess that physicists, which is what I was trained. You're trained, yeah. you're trained as a physicist. Yeah. A lot of them do back of the envelopes because it's easier than doing massive calculations of spreads. We've got a whiteboard over yeah, here. Just if go, you wanna, okay. go use it. Well, back of the envelopes actually often pretty accurate. Yeah. I, I was guessing the Inflation Reduction Act's total cost because of both mandates and subsidies. So mandates things that I get that you have to spend money on uh, that aren't appropriated money. So I guessed it was a trillion dollars of spending that's coming down the pike on green stuff. And Goldman Sachs did a pretty detailed analysis. Uh, I think it was only about a month and a half ago. Came to the same conclusion. Ballpark, trillion dollars. Even even in America today, that's a lot of money. But the difference is Goldman Sachs was writing it to show investors that there's a <laughs> there's a jackpot out here. Well, there is. This is it, this is it, where you should rush into it's if you're a, moral, a wealthy investor. It's a moral hazard problem. So let's not you know it, the obvious thing is once the government starts throwing money around. They distort markets uh, when they come in forms of both subsidies and mandates. 
So the market has been distorted. It's going to be distorted more in service, to your point, of replacing hydrocarbons, uh, oil, gas, and coal, which supply about a little over 80% of our energy, with wind and solar, and you know, mediated and moderated by batteries, which today, after half a trillion spent, provide about 4% of all our energy. So just <laughs> we got a long way to go from 4% of all of our energy with wind and solar, and less than 1% of our cars in America, by the way, despite all the hyperbole, we haven't broke, breached the 1% of cars being electric vehicles in America. And of the 0.8% of vehicles that are electric in America, more than half are in one state, and you can guess which state that is. So. Well, you make a point in your testimony, and I think in other places you've written, that you need to think about energy as something that's manufactured. Yeah. And what goes into producing right. hydrocarbon carbon energy versus yeah. wind and solar, right. et cetera. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's start there. What is it? What how, Build the pyramid of how we get from... Uh, yeah, the, the energy stuff is, is about money, always, always, always. But yeah. what people forget, and this is not philosophical, it's practical. Uh, all energy is free, and energy is infinitely available to humans for all practical purposes. The universe is gushing with energy. Energy is everywhere in, in the nature of the universe we live in. So the sun is free, but so is oil, coal, and gas. We didn't invent it. We didn't make it. It's just there. It doesn't matter why it's there. There's a lot of it there. It's just there. All energy systems to deliver useful power to society require building machines, all of them. You have to build machines. And so what you really want to know is how much material does it take to build the machines to make windmills and solar panels? And how much material does it take to build the machines that produce energy from oil and gas, to get the oil and gas, to move it, and to make it into electricity or make it into motion, mechanical power or heat. You want to know how much material you need, how many machines you build, because everything that exists in our universe, everything in our society, requires first digging something out of the ground. You have to get minerals, materials to make all products, and you have to make products to make services. So everything, everything begins with mining. In fact, mining uh, is a boring industry. It's the oldest industry in humanity. It predates mm -hmm. written history. It's not the oldest profession. It's the oldest industry. <laughs> Actually, mining may be the oldest profession. Who knows? <laughs> the, not to go down that rabbit hole. It's an old industry. That's another show. Yeah, well. it's another show. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it, you, you get nothing without mining first. You have to mine stuff, and then that takes information, knowledge to know where the mines are. You have to build machines to do the mining. You have to build machines to convert the raw materials into useful minerals and, and materials. Then you have to build machines to build machines. You have to build machines to install the machines. Everything's about machines and materials, it, including computers, including software, including AI, including healthcare. It all begins with mining and machines. So if you dig into that subject, no pun intended. Well, and this is your specialty at Northwestern. Well, I mean, I, future you know, of I, manufacturing. I mean, this is yeah, something. Manufacturing is a big deal, right? It, it's, yeah. And that's why we <clears> want to repatriate a lot of our manufacturing because it really matters. Right. Now, Another, what we're trying to yeah. do with manufacturing is to reduce the number of human beings involved in manufacturing the stuff we need because that is called productivity. It lowers costs of goods. So we've been trying to automate manufacturing of all kinds forever, and there'll be lots more of that. But repatriating is not a jobs issue. It's a political supply chain issue, as you know. We import uh, roughly 80 to 90 percent of the manufactured solar modules we use to make solar panels in America. They're manufactured. You know, this is news alert to nobody in China. Why does China manufacture most solar modules? Because they chose to. And we chose to run those businesses out of our country by virtue of regulations and taxation. China did the inverse through subsidies and, and we'll call it light, light regulations, a combination of those two things. They became the dominant producer of uh, polysilicon to make solar modules and the manufacturing of solar modules. It is relevant to say that, not just because of geopolitics, but because it's an incredibly energy-intensive process. But 100 times more energy to produce a pound of silicon than a pound of steel. We have to produce megatons of silicon to produce all these solar modules and solar arrays. And they're doing it in China on coal-fired grids. So when you do the, you know, the underlying forensics, you know, where does the stuff come from? Where do we dig it up? Who refines it? What you find out is a lot of energy used, carbon dioxide emissions associated with making windmills and solar arrays, 
enough to offset a lot with say, but not burning hydrocarbons. But more importantly, the point you began with is that environmentalists have fundamentally thrown under the bus all of the issues they used to care about, everything. Land use, use of toxic chemicals, uh, visual pollution, uh, habitat destruction, all those things have been thrown under the bus because the quantity of materials you need to produce the same unit of energy going wind solar increases by at least a thousand percent. You have to mine 10 times, 10 times more stuff to deliver the same mile of driving, same hour of YouTube, same hour of AI, tenfold increase that's locked into the physics of those machines. And the land use, the amount of land you occupy, you cover, also increases about tenfold. Well, you, 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 you've compared the uh, natural gas uh, plant that could heat, cool roughly 75,000 households yep. or homes with what an equivalent wind field uh, farm, or I guess I, I guess a wind farm. They call it wind it, farms. We should call oil fields now oil farms, seems to me. <laughs> I mean, the word farming has been, you know, co-opted and perverted. This is Orwellian again. It's not a farm. It's a well, giant field full of big machines. I, 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 call <laughs> them, I call them condor Cuisinarts. Well, they give you that, We're too, killing yeah. billions of year, birds every yeah. year with well, these get, so-called get, wind farms. You get dispensation for killing bald eagles with wind turbines, but if you do that as an oil guy, you better get ready to be zip-tied and perp-walked. <laughs> yeah. So, so but what about the, the, the land use and the manufacturing um, cost, or not cost, but also the amount of stuff you'd need to dig yeah. up to, to basically equal the, what that natural gas plant does. I, I, in a way to visualize it is, uh, you know, wind turbines that are being built today are about the size of a Washington monument, you know, two to three megawatts each. So you could have a, a field of 50 of those covering 100 square miles, you know, 10 miles by 10 miles. 10 by 10. You know, it could be five by five mile, square miles. It just depends on, you know, it could be two miles by two. If it's, you know, 20, 50, 100 square miles, a lot of square miles. And you got you need to build, obviously, 50 things the size of the Washington Monument. And you could replicate the amount of energy produced by that. This will power a, a small town of, say, twenty to 50,000 people, that okay. kind of range. So you're not talking about a city or Manhattan or Washington. You're talking about village-sized stuff. Uh, a single gas turbine, whose gas pipe is bare and you can't see, the size of a tractor trailer can uh, provide the same amount of electricity. This is a profound visual difference, obviously. Um, it, it doesn't take very much land. And if we count the land upstream, so now I've just counted the land you have to look at, but no one cares where we mine stuff because it's in Africa or Asia or Canada, my homeland. But if you count that too, you also have a tenfold increase in land use. Well, that's part of the wind and solar agenda is to shove all the cost of this off to developing countries, sure. Central America, South America, sure. Africa, sure. wherever else, somebody, someplace else. Well, yeah. Because permitting yeah. won't let you mine <laughs> right. stuff here. What goes into making a, a windmill or a wind farm? Well, the element of, what, what, what's the manufacturing? What are the materials? What's that cost? And what is that compared to what we have with uh, natural gas? So both machines, you, ha you have to use steel. Both machines use concrete, you know, the concrete foundations. Wind turbines are huge, big concrete foundation. Uh, you know, combustion turbines use steel uh, to build the turbine itself. Uh, the wind turbine uh, tower is made out of steel. And then you have the, the electrical components, which involve what's called electrical grade steel and neodymium and cadmium, all kinds of you know, metals. Uh, and then you have the big plastic blades. So you obviously don't have big plastic blades for a combustion turbine. But the, big, the big difference is in two areas, the quantity of stuff you need per unit of energy. Again, the amount of concrete, glass, you know, polymers, plastics, uh, and uh, steel you need per unit of energy goes up again, tenfold per unit of energy produced compared to the gas turbine. And then you have to have somewhere between a 10 and 100 fold increase, or an infinite if you like, by increase in use of metals that the gas turbines don't use. Like, you know, neodymium magnets require the rare earth neodymium to be mined and refined somewhere, most of which is in China again. So the quantities of these materials are huge. They are often different in nature. That's, that is, we produce concrete here. We actually produce a remarkable amount of steel in America. The interesting thing about Wind turbines, of course, is their blades. That's what 
that's what that's what they gather the energy from the moving wind. They are reinforced uh, fiberglass. They're essentially plastic. So that small wind farm that I just described for twenty to thirty thousand, maybe forty thousand people, uh, it it requires the production of enough non-recyclable plastic. It's not recyclable plastic. This is these are just buried in landfill when you're done. The quantity of that plastic in that one small wind farm is greater than all the plastic used to make all the world's plastic straws, which environmentalists are very upset about. Now, plastic straws are recyclable. Are they upset about that fact, or they're upset about the... Well, I would think both. As soon as you tell them that, they're going to be... all kinds of stuff. Either way, yeah. But just the the asymmetry in our anxieties, if you like, about plastic straws versus unrecyclable plastic blades and wind turbines, to which the response is, we'll make them recyclable one day. Okay, well, we could wait until you figured out how to do that. Well, that's what I mentioned. There's so many things are... TBD to be determined to on the com technologies that haven't been invented yeah. yet. So yeah, we're, we're, my favorite line is that they want to build everything from unobtainium. It just to define out un- unobtainium. Un- unobtainium is the magical perfect element that uh, you can produce with no consequence, no mining is required. It produces a, a inf- infinite energy supplies with no no emissions of any kind, and it's free and cheap. Makes your life wonderful. Unobtainium. This is the Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with Mark. Mills, Manhattan Institute, and a lot of other great affiliations, and we're we're talking about the new Holy Grail, which is uh, an element called the unobtainium. Unobtainium. <laughs> Unobtain. I can't pronounce it. Unobtainium. It's a new element. It's a new element. New element. Added okay. to the periodic periodic table. <laughs> anyway, that's it's it, it's a great uh, metaphor for what's happening with the uh, environmental movement as they try to push us to be totally dependent on wind and solar. Now, the wind farms that we're talking about, it's not, so you've got the cost of that, but then how much, how much to mine this? How many, how many mines are we going to have to create around the world if they realize the dream of significant dependence on wind? Well, so we come back to the baseline. You have to increase the total supply of metals and minerals, copper, nickel, lithium, aluminum, you know, molybdenum, neodymium. Not on, on obtainium, because that doesn't exist. But you have to increase that tenfold. So how many more mines would you need? It's a reasonable question. The question has been answered by the International Energy Agency themselves, by the World Bank, by geological surveys. It's knowable, because we know a lot about these minerals. Uh, the answer is we are not now mining, or nor have enough mines on the planet to do this. You need hundreds of new mines, not a few, hundreds of new mines. By one estimate, nearly 400 new giant mines across the different types of metals and minerals from, you know, nickel and, and uh, cobalt to lithium and, and aluminum. Now, so we're what, not going to put those what, in Martha's Vineyard. Well, yeah, yeah. well, why not just, you'd say, why not just build them? Market forces will work. I mean, after all, if demand goes up, supply will follow. This is true. And then you have this disingenuous, puerile, infantile response from many environmentalists. Oh, Mills is a Malthusian, doesn't think we have enough minerals in the earth. I'm accused of being a Malthusian recently. One of the most grievous insults to me, I'm an anti-Malthusian. Sure. There are plenty of minerals in the earth's crust. I'm, I'm, I'm on the camp of a functional infinite supply of minerals and energy and food for humans. The limits are what we're willing to do and where, at what price, environmentally, economically. What you want to know is not whether there's enough copper in the earth's crust. That's a silly silly distraction. It's how many copper mines exist. Is anybody expanding the copper mines? And how much do the copper mines, just let's pick copper because it's one of the oldest, maybe the oldest mined metal. So we need to increase copper mining about 200 to 250% alone in the next decade to meet the aspirations, just copper, to meet the aspirations. Mark, when this, I come on the show, be, be sure to, be sure be to uh, turn off your phone. I think that's your broker. That's my phone. No, this is Steve Moore. We're worried about the debt well, ceiling right now. Steve is Steve is a friend. He's, tell him hi. I'm tell him I'm, I'm glad he fixed the debt ceiling. I think I'll wait to call him back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, he takes second second tier after me. After all, he's just Steve Moore. I know. He's just Steve Moore. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Uber economist. So the, all these mines, we're not going to put them in uh, Martha's Vineyard. We're not going to even put them in the United States. You can't do it because it's, of the permitting. It's very, it's very tough. So they're they're administ- going to go where? Chile? Well, this administration has banned uh, three mines that got through the permitting process, spending millions of dollars in the last right. year. So you're right. We're not going to expand mining uh, at the level needed to do it here. So you just, you'd want to know where the world's mines are, where, the, where they're willing to expand. 
But we know that. It's, it's places like Chile, Bolivia, China, South, a, lot of the, a lot of African countries. Chinese investors are very active in Africa, expanding mines there. You could say it's because they have uh, rich ore bodies, which they do. They also are far more susceptible to corruption, unfortunately. And this is what the Chinese have uh, pretty much overtly engaged in. You know, we, we go to a, a country to say, well, we'd like to help you open a copper mine to feed our appetite for electric cars and windmills, solar arrays, uh, and loan them money. We attach lots of strings to it, uh, many of them reasonable, about environmental practices and child labor laws. You know, it's kind of nice not to mine things, not using children, in my opinion. Which the is Ch what they do in the Congo. Exactly. Well, the Chinese are not quite that strict. They, they don't have any of those strings attached to it. They, they simply loan the money, build the infrastructure, uh, and harvest the minerals, refine them in China, and ship them to us so we can use our taxpayers' money to pay, to pay more for our electricity. I mean, it's an opposite of a virtuous circle. It's, a, to, your, to your point, a villainous circle when it involves uh, abrogating basic uh, labor standards. I don't mean labor union standards. I mean labor standards we take for granted in our country. Mm -hmm. They don't take for granted in many places of the world. We, we can mine cleanly and safely. It can be done. We do it in America. It's not done that way everywhere in the world. So to your point, environmentalists are broadly sweeping under the rug uh, these consequences, environmental and human consequences. Those that are noticing it, I, I got to give a shout out and credit to both the Washington Post and New York Times lately. It, far be it for me. We to, just lost uh, half our viewers. Uh, yeah, yeah, but they, you can Google, <laughs> use Magic Dr. Google, do WAPO or New York Times okay. mining for minerals, for energy. They, they, they've just published in the last few months excellent investigative journalism. Washington Post went to Indonesia, one of the, the world's biggest source of nickel. Nickel is on every electric car. It's in steel. It's, it's the essential metal. We're going to have to increase nickel supplies several hundred percent in the, de in the decade. So the world's biggest nickel producer is expanding nickel mines. And they're embargoing the export of nickel ore, requiring you to invest in their country in nickel refineries, like all things... So Washington Post went and did an investigation and discovered, you know, quel horreur, that it's a big, dirty process, really hard, involves mm -hmm. lots of toxic chemicals. It's, it's a, a very honest, uh, eye-opening piece for people who have not read anything about what's involved in mining. It's, it's, a, it's a big, difficult industry. And doing it in countries that are not, uh, let's just say, meeting Western standards, and they'd say they're trying, and, I, and, they, and the government probably states that, and they may actually want to. I don't want to judge, I don't want to judge them morally in that sense, but as a practical matter, what's going on will shock most people. Well, if you multiply the number of mines we need for solar with the number of mines, add the number of nines to, for when, and yep. also batteries. Exactly. Hundreds and hundreds of we're mines. We're talking millions of square miles, really. We're going we're right. to kill the habitat. Uh, right. All over the planet. Well, it's not just land use. I mean, when you, when you mine, you create, do create a lot of waste. It's probably the unavoidably the most wasteful process that humans engage in. There's nothing comes close. Uh, it, it, and this is not new. This is, this is not, not a news alert. What people don't realize is that, with very few exceptions, the minerals that we need, like let's use copper, because, again, it's not substitutable. This is true for all the minerals. The, the share of the ore, the rock that you mine, that is, contains the metal you want is very small. A few percent. Copper ore grades average 1%. Yeah. Put differently, that means you have to mine a ton of copper to get a 20 pounds of copper ore, a ton of copper ore to get 20 pounds of copper. And if you need megatons of copper, you're talking gigatons of rocks dug up, crushed, creating waste. And then to get the copper out of the copper ore, this is just something that most people haven't really thought about, you have to literally dissolve rock with chemicals. You can't, you can't, you can't, you, it's not like you're, you're, you're digging up soil and, oh, there's copper. You have to dig up rock, crush it, grind it, dissolve it with chemicals, toxic chemicals. You have to handle it carefully and then chemically refine the material to get the pure metal, whether, whether it's copper or molybdenum or neodymium or a rare earth, whatever the rare earth is. This is a, these are very, very land and materials intensive processes. We've spent centuries trying to get good at it. We've become very good at it, but it's slow process. You, know, you didn't even talk about, you talk about land use. What about just, just money? I mean, 
Each new mine is billions of dollars of capital investment, a, a big copper mine, 10 or $20 billion. We're talking dozens of copper mines. Well, and none of this would be investable with that government subsidies. So exactly. So you'd want to know. I mean, one action I mean, I want to get to that at the end is that we need to stop these subsidies, oh, subsidies. because it's, 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 it's inciting, it's, in, it's, it's, it's eliciting behavior, which is egregious. It's, it's a grotesque moral hazard when you engage in subsidies. Subsidies have a role, narrowly targeted, time-limited use of subsidies is a very, very old tool in governance and has unequivocal got equivocal value in very specific areas, particularly military domains, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But it comes to general markets. The behavior of markets are egregiously distorted by massive subsidies. I mean, it's crazy. It's a moral hazard. If you're in a business and you've got hundreds of billions of dollars gushing into the federal trough, every business out there, certainly everyone I've talked to, and they all overtly, right? They're searching, they're searching to see how they can bend their business to get some of that free money. Well, and it's massive. The recent bill, we called it the Green Energy, we now call it the Green Energy yeah. Act instead of the Inflation Reduction yeah, Act, which exactly. is grotesquely misnamed. Uh, that's really also provided incentives for the communities all over the, all over the United States to try to get some of that of subsidy. Of so they're embedding, embedding a constituency of course. for the climate change right. agenda, a lot like they embedded sure. a constituency for, let's say, ethanol. Yeah, and it's pretty powerful. As uh, you know, Republicans have a hard time Speaking Republicans are all in on this. On ethanol because of Iowa. Right. And the truth be told, there is a role for a small amount of it. Let's, <clears> let's <throat> use ethanol. Let's just, let's just assume for the sake of discussion that ethanol can be produced at break even with oil, which is not true, but it's not crazy far off, not the way wind and solar are, for the sake of discussion. And if you want to replace 5% of our oil use with ethanol, doesn't have a, even if it's a little more expensive, it's a domestic product too, doesn't distort the market profoundly. So if you said to me, I want to do the same thing with wind and solar, I want to replace 5% of our energy with wind and solar. Just 5%. 5% or ten, pick 10. I mean, small okay. numbers. Pick 10. Not a profound distortion in, in markets, really. If you subsidize that, I, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying, you know, but when you say, oh, we need to replace all hydrocarbons with wind, solar, and batteries. You're, you're not making a small subsidy distortion. You're now saying I have to subsidize, by definition, all American energy production. And you subsidize electric vehicles. You want them to all be EVs, which are inherently more expensive because of the materials. They're inherently more expensive because of the materials. They're not, we're not going to engineer that away. The battery weighs 1,000 pounds to replace about 80 pounds of gasoline. So if you want to subsidize that, you have to subsidize all car purchases in perpetuity because there's no engineering path to make them cheaper. Without subsidies, none of this is investable. We'll and say, I'm speaking as an old private equity yeah, guy. I would, here, I would here. say uh, a few percentage points okay, of Okay, I won't say infinitesimal amount is, 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 meets the market yeah. test. As a, as a, yeah, it, if, you're, if you're investing in private equity in this, you're making a bet. You're making a bet on the government subsidies. So we've got a couple of ne other effects here. We've got the manufacturing, mining issue. But then you've also got the fact that wind and solar is not, it, it's not storable. Yeah. And so you've got to build massive batteries right. to store this energy. Whereas right. if you've got natural gas or a barrel of right. oil, right. it's not only the energy, but it also store is a storage unit. Right. Well, so then you'd want to know the obvious there. Well, you can always store it. There's all kinds of ways to store energy. There's... Uh, practical ways like oil in a tank. There's uh, obvious ways like electricity in a battery. And there are goofy ways that are even being proposed and funded by goofy private equity guys, which I call the Fred Flintstone technique for storing electricity. They take <laughs> big rocks when you have extra electricity, when nobody needs it from the sun, and you drag the rock up with a crane. And then when you need the energy, you let the rock drop connected to a wire to a motor generator, and it generates electricity. It, <laughs> it works. It's silly. It's infantile. All you'd want to know, it's Fred Flintstone come to life. You'd want to know, what does it really cost compared to, say, just storing the oil in the first place? Yeah. Depending on the technology, somewhere between 10 and 100 times more expensive to store the same unit of energy with these, whether it's a battery, I don't care what the battery is, or Fred Flintstone techniques, there's somebody even proposing using trains, filling the trains full of rocks, 
when you have extra electricity, when nobody wants the wind power, because that's what happens. Wind produces it when you don't need it, and not when you do need it. You run the train up a hill with electric motors, and then when you need the energy, the train runs down the hill, and the motors reverse and become generators. A Fred Flintstone on wheels. I mean, it's really silly stuff. It technically works, but it's profoundly silly and profoundly expensive. And yes, yeah, so with windmills and solar, you need to store the energy. You can do it. It just costs money. Just, just costs money. So then the response is, well, uh, the technology will get cheaper. Y yes, it will. But when you're starting with a basis that's more than 10 times more expensive. Even cheaper doesn't meet a market. It doesn't test. get you close. No, it doesn't get close. Or you, you, you know that those, it's always windy or, or sunny somewhere. You've heard that. So we don't just build more transmission lines. Just build. Well, the transmission lines are a huge problem because exactly. all the wind and solar is exactly. off in some remote place and you right. got to get it to a that city. That, apparently that costs money too. Yeah. Apparently. But more, <laughs> more importantly. Well, that's in, the, that's in the last bill. It is in the last bill. Yeah. Subsidized. And also they're hoping to override local communities and states' objections to transmission lines. That's the goal. Most of the goals, if you peel away the layers of costs. So right now, the states control whether you can have a transmission line. Yeah, they want to make that a federal power. So they want the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to preempt any state inputs on where right. this moves. Now, what happens is there are federal preemptions, but you know, it's a, it's in our, in our federal system, this is the kabuki dance that we've had, which has been extremely effective at preserving freedoms and liberties and, and the diversity of solutions in American states, as you know. But in service of the climate agenda to change our energy systems, all those things are to be thrown out. All of the freedoms, all the subsidiarity of pushing decisions to states yet, are to be thrown out. Yet another attack on federalism. Oh, it is. It's a, yeah. uh, and, and it's an overt, this is not a, a subtle attack, it's an overt attack. So this is uh, Bill Walton. I'm here with Mark Mills, the Manhattan Institute, uh, a deep thinker about uh, all things energy and many other topics as well. Um, and I'm about to learn what embodied energy is. <laughs> Do you really <laughs> want to know? I really want to know. It's in your it's in your testimony, and I thought it was extremely interesting. About well, I'll let you let you explain embodied well, energy. Well, since I started by pointing out that you can't build anything without digging something out of the ground first. Yeah, you need to get minerals to make everything. Uh, polymers is not digging stuff. You have to drill for oil and gas. Uh, it takes energy to do that. So the energy that's used to make a product is called the embodied energy. When you make a glass, the energy it takes to make a pound of glass is a well-known number. The energy it takes to make a pound of steel is a well-known number. We know how much energy it takes to make a car. And so the energy used to make something also has associated with emissions for making that thing. So when you import an, uh, an electric car, you're actually exporting energy used elsewhere, by definition, and emissions that have happened elsewhere. So to make an electric car battery, the, the battery that stores the electricity, you have to use energy. How much do you have to use? Well, it depends on where you make the battery's materials, but something on the order of 300 barrels of oil equivalent of energy are used to make enough batteries to store one barrel of oil equivalent of energy. So you buy an energy. 300 barrels to get one barrel? Right. To store one, you still have to make the energy, but that's the battery that can store a barrel of oil equivalent in electric form requires energy used somewhere else, 300 barrels of oil equivalent worth. And that number, the energy used to make the battery, this is the key thing that is being ignored in all these futuristic debates. That number is going up, not down. While we engineer better and better ways to mine and manufacture things, that reduces energy use. Mother Nature has a surprise for us. <laughs> the ore grades, the percentage of minerals in rocks, has been declining for centuries. So every time ore grade goes down, you can do the arithmetic here, you have to dig up more rock to get the same quantity of copper or nickel or aluminum which means you use more energy. So the, so the marginal new pound of copper, the marginal new pound of aluminum, the marginal new pound of nickel in the f near future has higher energy use because of declining ore grades locked into the geology of the planet we live on, which means the emissions for each marginal pound or ton are going up. So the embodied energy, the embodied emissions for building wind turbines solar arrays and electric cars are rising. We know they're rising. This is not 
Mark Mill saying it. This is a geologist telling us something. The World Bank knows this. And again, back to the IEA, the Inter International Energy Agency, who are indefatigable uh, champions of the energy transition. In their technical documents, they point out in elliptical language, but clear, that the emissions and energy use from mining each new pound of metals that are needed are rising. And I love this language they use. Off could offset some of the benefits of not burning gasoline. Could offset? Excuse, excuse yeah. me? You've got a chart in your uh, testimony that I thought might be useful to put up on the put up on the screen now. It's called Mineral Requirements to Build Different uh, right. Different Energy Machines. You want to yeah. speak to that? Well, you know, what we have are two classes of minerals you need to build energy machines. To so go back, to, you, you need to mine, you have to make, everything requires almost everything using steel, copper, glass, and plastics, uh, aluminum, so the basic metals. So you have roughly a tenfold <clears throat> to 20-fold increase per unit of energy delivered to go from combustion turbines or coal plants or nuclear plants to wind and solar. That's the basic material. So that's a lot of land use. I mean, you've got to dig up a lot of rock. You've got to make a lot of concrete, a lot of glass. Glass uses natural gas. Glass uses coal. Concrete uses coal, natural gas. Steel uses metallurgical coal. We have no other way to make steel right now, and we won't for a long time without using metallurgical coal. Coal use in the world is going up, not down, by the way. So all those material uses, we're going to accelerate their use, not because of population growth, not because of wealth growth, because the decision to go from combustion of hydrocarbons to wind, solar, and batteries will increase by more than tenfold basic material requirements. So I, I, show me on this chart what you mean, because we're going we're gonna to have this up yeah, on we'll, the screen. We'll I put wanna... this on the chart. So if you look at uh, the, the graph that shows you a natural gas combustion turbine, and mm -hmm. you can see that the, the, the bar height to produce the metals and the concrete and the glass you need, it's almost invisible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're looking at something on the order, if you do the math, you're sort of, per unit of energy, you need, uh, you know, a thousand tons of X, a thousand tons of those materials. If you go to solar PV, you, you need something on the order of 15,000 tons. So you have 15 fold increase on the basic, basic materials. We're not talking about exotic materials like rare earths. We're not talking about cobalt lithium, we mean basic materials. Now, you'd say, how could that possibly be? The sun is free. Well, the sun is dilute. So if you look at a picture of a, I'll go back to just image, you can go to Google Images and get an image of a 100 megawatt power plant combustion turbine. Again, it's about the size of a, of a uh, tractor trailer. You can get a picture of a 100 megawatt solar farm. And you look at acres and acres of land covered in aluminum frames, copper wires, glass covered solar cells, this hundreds of acres of stuff takes 15 times more physical tonnage of materials just to build. So, so we build all these machines, these wind machines, we build the solar machines, but then they wear out. What Lots happens? What happens then? Details, details. I mean, you know, just, just waste, whatever. <laughs> well, it's massive oh, waste. It's massive waste. So the waste production if you have, yes. a, we have another got a, graph. We've got another graph there? Okay. So the, using, again, this is, we go to IEA data, uh, World yeah. Bank data. What yeah, you find good. is, let's just do the, the wind turbine blades, because this is what is not recyclable. This is what the World Bank and IEA are worried about. You can recycle uh, the, the steel. Steel is very easy to recycle. Uh, you can recycle aluminum. It's extremely easy to recycle. So recycling rates there are very high. But you've got all this non-recyclable plastic, you have to throw it out. And what you find out is you go from today where you have you know, a few thousands of tons of these plastic blades being cut up and put in a landfill because we're just at the beginning of the end of the life of all these solar far wind farms. They last about 20 years. Sometimes they only last 10 years. They wear out prematurely or you have a new blade that's more efficient, so you replace them. But let's just take the 20 years. Most con combustion power plants have a lifespan of 30 to 40 years. So you're, you're not only using 10 times more material and you build triple the number of power plants. So now we're going to 30-fold increase in the tonnage of stuff. It accumulates. You're going to do something with it. So that you've got uh, a lot of people in the environmental community, in, we'll call it the global uh, World Bank class of community, looking at this and anxious that we're going to generate this massive quantity of waste. What will we do with it? So they're pushing hard to come up with uh, the next generation of blades being recyclable, for example. 
Okay. But it doesn't exist. They yet. don't exist today. Yeah. They're not, it's not theoretically impossible. It's just, they don't exist today. So we're going to have not just a few tons, you know, tens of thousands and then ultimately millions of tons of waste, including solar panel waste. I mean, the, the kind of metals that are put in the glass on top of solar panels to stabilize the glass mm. from being damaged by UV light uh, render most solar glass as a technical hazardous waste. So it can't just be casually thrown away. So ultimately, somebody has to break down all those things, spend the money and time, uh, bury it somewhere. I'm, by the way, I'm not in the camp that was worried about having enough landfill for this. We, the planet's really big. You well, build, well, China no longer will take they it. They won't take it, but build a big hole in Nevada. They, 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 they declared a couple of years ago <laughs> they didn't want to take it. It was dangerous. Well, they, they, I think this was a stick in the eye, uh, frankly, was, yeah. to, to the United States. <laughs> uh, they're not really that worried about the dangerous stuff, we don't think. But uh, they were getting in trouble. They were getting spanked for uh, putting, about, well, I think it's 80% of the world's plastic waste going into the oceans comes out of the uh, Yangtze and a few other rivers in China where they don't particularly take a lot of care to handle the trash that we were sending them. So China has the dirtiest rivers on the planet. They, they do. They do. So the, the, the path to clean rivers is called wealth, and the path to wealth is called cheap energy. And what we're now doing is making energy more expensive and increasing the quantity not of waste. Not slightly more expensive, dramatically more expensive. Yeah, yeah and more and, so... And, and also yeah. not available. You, you mentioned something in your testimony. A Dutch government-sponsored study concluded yeah. that Netherlands alone, its yeah. green ambitions, would consume a major share yeah. of all the world's minerals. Yeah, of, of today's one country, today's world production level. Yeah, one 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 region, one country. Yeah, exactly. If they went 100 percent green, their their call for cobalt, lithium. But they did the calculation. It's to do everything, not just electric cars. Everything in society is going to be powered by electricity produced by windmills and solar arrays. So so cobalt, lithium. Yep. Indium, and then all those other uh, uh, elements that I can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> the alphabet soup from the periodic table that everybody's forgotten from high school. Which chemistry. I'm sure you have it. I'm sure you but have the periodic it, table memorized. And neodymium. 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 Yeah. Okay, well, I magic, got close magic, there. But we, magic, not, we, need, metal. we need 400 times more neodymium if we, yeah. if we do this. And this is according to the World Bank. That's uh, right. Aren't we, you know, it just seems we talk about becoming more dependent on China. This is this is dependency on steroids. Well, sure. And, and this is this is now an open secret. You know, China, China is the utterly dominant producer of refined what the IEA calls energy minerals. Yeah. Uh, their market share, just to put this in the context of the, the things that are being vilified, China's market share for refined energy minerals is more than double OPEC's market share of world oil. So the geopolitical and price concentration power of energy stuff it, for China is double that of OPEC. So we spent, what, 50 years wringing our hands over resource concentration and hydrocarbons. And now we've allowed to happen and are now going to encourage accelerating a resource dependency on China, that's more than double, more than double the resource dependency. Well, and there used to be all these stories about whether OPEC could agree on something. Um, I'm sure China will agree with itself. It, it's, it does exactly. We don't have we we don't have to. The, the, would would China exercise pricing power when it's convenient for them? This is a question, as they say, that answers itself. Oh yeah, President Xi. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, there's so many factoids. I'm running a bit out of time. I just wanted to get some things in here that I think people who are pushing electric vehicles and mandating electric trucks in California ought to learn that electric car battery, a uh, single battery has about useful, about a thousand, thousand pounds, but the total amount of mining materials that required is 500,000 pounds. Yeah. Well, this is the easiest way to explain it. When you talk about increasing world mining by tenfold, I, I, it, See, for, that doesn't even get close. It, but, it, but it doesn't even mean, you, you think, well, does that matter? You know, saying something about the world growing. It's hard to, it's hard it's to hard visualize. To visualize. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What you want to visualize is for one car, if you have the gasoline version, you have a gas tank and you put about 70, 80, 80 pounds of ga uh, gasoline in it. And the electric vehicle doesn't have a gas tank. The battery weighs 1,000 pounds, which is why the electric vehicles use a lot more aluminum, which is a whole other embodied energy story. But to get the materials to make that one battery, 
on average, you have to dig up about 500,000 pounds of the earth. Or put differently, this is doing tons. One car, which weighs about a ton, roughly, with a, with a half ton battery, takes 250 tons of digging up rock and stuff somewhere else to make that one car, that one EV. Now, to, to do it for the regular car, I don't need 250 tons to be dug up. I, 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 need, I need tonnage too, but I don't have a battery. I don't have to get copper. I don't have to, the same quantity of copper. I don't need any cobalt. So another one, if wind turbines were to supply half the world's electricity, nearly 2 billion tons of coal yeah. would have to be consumed <laughs> to produce the concrete and steel. Yeah, it's, it, there's an inconvenient fact. So we use coal to make steel and concrete. Uh, the energy transitionists, those who think we should get off of coal, oil, and gas, point out that it's theoretically possible to use other means to make steel. This is true. You can use hydrogen to make steel and produce the hydrogen you know, by electrolyzing water with wind turbine electricity. All these elliptical solutions are in theory possible. They're extremely expensive, not scaled or scalable. In the world we live in that we're subsidizing today, so invoking new technologies to make steel, for example, without using coal, is silly and irrelevant. The subsidies are intended to pay for what we know how to build today. Mm. So the wind turbines we're going to build tomorrow with today's subsidies will use technologies that we know how to use today, which means millions and billions of tons of coal consumed in service of making polysilicon for solar modules, steel for wind turbines, aluminum for solar modules, lithium and cobalt for batteries, using coal, gas, and oil, largely in China, but also in Africa and South America. Some of it in Canada and Australia. I keep coming back there because one of the outs in the subsidy game is to subsidize mining in our friendly neighbors like Canada and Australia, which is what's going on right now. So the requirement in the Orwellian Inflation Reduction Act that the subsidies require you to use U.S. sourced materials is being uh, unsurprisingly elastically meant to define from our friends too. So we're doing direct subsidies from U.S. taxpayers for mines in Australia. Hey, you know, I like the Australians. I think it's a great country and, you know, God bless them. But why are we subsidizing Australian mines? Great question. <laughs> uh, I know the answer. Well, you do know the <laughs> answer. But, but it's, it's, you know, it, 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 implicit in what we're talking about today is this whole madness has been aimed at reducing CO2. Yeah. And you and I can talk at length, I think, about whether we think that's a real, real, real problem, but that's not what we want to do now. But yeah. it strikes me as listening to everything you're saying, and we've only, hand, we've only talked about a half dozen of, of, of many, many, many more examples you've got. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it seems like all that all that activity is going to increase CO two levels. All the manufacturing, yeah. all the embedded right. energy, all that stuff. Yeah. So, in order to knock out so called uh, uh, CO two increases from uh, from hydrocarbons, we're going to increase it dramatically from from manufacturing all the stuff to to stop the thing we're trying. To... Yeah, sure. In fact. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting, this is a circular, I'm trying to come in for a landing here. Yeah, it gives you, gives you a headache. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's entirely reasonable to say, and, and this is not hyperbole, that many of the electric cars that will be driven in America in the near future, uh, of course they aren't burning gasoline and that eliminates the CO2 from that combustion. But the CO2 emitted to build the electric cars, batteries and mine the materials will offset most, if not all, of the CO2 that not emitted by not burning gasoline in the first place, which means the economic trade through this massive subsidy buys you not, not only nothing in CO2 terms, or very, very little, but it buys you the export of jobs, geopolitical dependencies, and environmental impacts somewhere on the planet for no benefit. So th this sort of total fuel cycle analysis, which is difficult to do, everybody would like to do it, uh, is impossible to regulate because it's the world's labyrinthine uh, mineral supply chains, industrial refineries all over the planet. But we do know that CO2 emissions on the planet are going up. We, the world has spent something on the order of 5 to $10 trillion in the last two decades 
in service of avoiding using hydrocarbons. And the quantity of hydrocarbons used by the world has increased mm -hmm. over that time. Total CO2 emissions have gone up on the world. And that's what's going to keep happening. That's, that's locked into the nature of the sort of the engineering physics of the universe we live in. It's locked into the nature of the fact that China, let's just use China, has announced that whatever they're going to do to cut hydrocarbon use will be post-2050. So we're being told... Post-2050, yeah. yeah. So we have this... Whereas we're going to put all the, have all the trucks in California on electric bet, like, sure. vehicles by 2030. I'll, I'll, I'll take the bet Yeah. that that won't happen, and no. but it will cost a lot of pain and money along, along the way. One last point, and then we got to, we got to get out of here. Um, but I've got about 53,000 other things I want to talk to you about. So you have to come back, um, <laughs> come back with another fusillade of facts. If you, if you, if you if you if you spent your life in the, in the investment world, looking for growth companies and, and you big believer that growth is the yeah. way to make people more prosperous and happier and make society a, a more livable place. Everything we're talking about here seems to be killing economic yeah, growth. It does. But as you and I have talked about, yeah. they don't care. In fact, they think the agenda ought to be degrowth. Well, I think it's no, it's no, you're right. And it's no longer uh, an insult or an invective to accuse a lot of environmentalists of being degrowth. This is overtly a strategy, honestly, uh, outwardly pursued. There's a big conference coming up in Europe that the EU is funding on degrowth, how to how to make people happy in a, a degrowth world. So what they're in effect implicitly, if not explicitly acknowledging, is that all of those green stuff we're spending money on doesn't solve the problem. They're actually some of them are overtly admitting because the things I'm saying are not disputable. They're just facts. It's not about whether there's climate's warming or not. Copper is copper whether you think the climate's warming or not. Oral grades are declining, what, no matter what you think about climate change. They know this, the smarter environmentalists. So what they're saying overtly is, therefore, if wind, solar, and batteries won't cut CO2 emissions, the way you have fewer emissions is to use less energy, less growth, fewer people. So they are overtly for engineering a society in which you will be happy without growth, without economic growth. The, if you like, the sine qua non of civilization has been to elevate the prosperity and uh, the maximum number of people. Most people out of poverty. And we're going to, we're going to reverse that and create this fiction. And they're over, again, they're overt about this, that you can be happy. You will be happier in the future where you have less stuff, less travel, fewer freedoms, because that will be in service of less energy uses, which is, they are saying, a priori needed to achieve the goals they have articulated for cutting the carbon dioxide emissions of the planet. It's another way of saying there is no possibility, that what they're essentially saying, there is no possibility, and I agree with them, on cutting carbon dioxide emissions of the planet, absent huge degrowth, which is a euphemism for massive global recession. That's what it's a euphemism for. I'm speechless. <laughs> and what you say I, I, confirms what I've been yeah. hearing. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah. This has been the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with, uh, been here with Mark Mills, Manhattan Institute, who, uh, although we ended on a fairly dour note, Mark's written a terrific book, the title. <laughs> where, where am I roaring 2020s? Well, <laughs> well. <laughs> Because, the cloud revolution, yeah. About, because there is another side of this story. I think there, there are two things we need to get into here in the future when Mark comes back, is we need to have a real discussion about CO2 and whether that's really the, the threat that it's supposed to be. And the other thing we need to talk about is all the positive things that are happening in uh, the technology area. You know, People are now worried about artificial intelligence. Obviously, that's something we need to be concerned about, but there are a lot of things that are going to make the world a lot better and so we've got these these opposing forces, and we need to know what side we're going to be on. So, Mark, pleasure. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you for uh, a chance to uh, be dystopian. All right. Well, we're... <laughs> as, as opposed to being the last optimist. <laughs> well, well, but next time you're going to come on as the last opposite, then I think I'll join you in that. I hope. Uh, anyway, the Bill Walton Show. Where you can find us as always on all the major podcast platforms: YouTube, Rumble. 
uh, Substack now. Um, we're on CPAC now on Monday nights and probably soon to be adding another night since we're doing more shows. Uh, send us your comments. Uh, I put either through Substack or on our website. As you know, we pay a lot of attention to the kind of people you'd like to hear from and the kind of topics you'd like us to get into. As always, we're trying to take complicated matters and, and make it plain what's at stake for us and what we can do about it. So anyway, thanks for joining and uh, talk with you soon. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.